Hello and welcome to episode 37 of the Four Progress Football Podcast. I am your host, Zach Party, and today we're continuing things off in the NFC West with the Los Angeles Rams. So let's get on into it. So in case you're new here, what we do is we go over uh, team by team, position by position, and just give like a general overview of the whole roster. And then I talk about their season outlook, what I think their floor and ceiling will be, um, a pessimistic outlook on the season, optimistic outlook, as well as talking about the over under set by Vegas, whether or not I think that this team will hit the over or under, and then the biggest strength and weakness on this roster. At the end of this whole series, I'm going to be doing a whole season prediction where I'll give my official win totals for each team, as well as a playoff prediction and a season's award prediction. So if you want to stick around for that, hit the subscribe button. But for now, let's get on into the Los Angeles Rams. So kicking things off with quarterbacks, as always, they're going to go with Matthew Stafford, John Wolford, Bryce Perkins, and Luis Perez. So Stafford, he's always been a good quarterback, but he was never able to elevate the Lions to be serious contenders. However, on his first year with the Rams, he was able to execute the offense and lead this team to a Super Bowl victory. Stafford had his best statistical season since 2011, and his elite arm talent was able to execute everything that McVay wanted out of this offense. His playmaking ability allowed McVay to expand this offense more so than under Jared Goff, and his instant chemistry with Cooper Cup was historic. He had more turnover-worthy plays than what you would want to see, though, so... Hopefully, though, in year two with the offense and with the addition of Allen Robinson, um, I wouldn't be shocked at all to see Stafford ascend to even further heights this year. Wolford is like a toolsy backup type. He hasn't really played much yet, but has years of experience in the system. Perkins went undrafted in 2020, but also hasn't played yet. And Perez went in undrafted in 2018, but hasn't played. So for running backs, they have Cam Akers, Daryl Henderson Jr., Kyron Williams, Jake Funk, Raymond Calais, Trey Regis, and A.J. Rose. Akers was taken in the second round in 2020, but tore his Achilles before the season started. Somehow, he came back for Week 18 and then contributed to the Super Bowl run. He's an explosive back who took advantage of having good blocking, having over 600 yards as a rookie in split snaps. If he can stay healthy, he's got a good chance to put up some monster numbers here. Henderson is a good backup for the Rams, putting up over 600 yards each of these last two years, despite also dealing with injuries. He's an undersized back at 5'8", but he has some pretty good top speed and has yet to fumble in his career. Williams is a rookie taken in the 5th round this year out of Notre Dame. Funk was picked in the 7th round last year but didn't see significant actions. Calais was taken by the Bucks in the 7th round in 2020 but hasn't played at all yet. Regis went undrafted last year but only took one snap and Rose went undrafted last year but didn't play at all. So for wide receivers, they have Cooper Cup, Allen Robinson II, Van Jefferson, Ben Skowronek, Tutu Atwell, Brandon Powell, Warren Jackson, Jacob Harris, J.J. Koski, Landon Akers, Austin Trammell, and Lance McCutcheon. Cooper Cup was the best statistical receiver in the league last year, winning the Triple Crown in his first year with Matthew Stafford. He's an elite separator and has super sure hands, one of the better contested catch receivers, and is a monster after the catch. He's able to win both inside and out and might be the best run blocking receiver in the league, allowing this offense to effectively run the ball out of 11 personnel. He honestly might just be the overall most valuable receiver in the league due to just his effectiveness as a receiver in general, but also the value he does provide in the run game is so much beyond most other receivers. Robinson could definitely be the best number two in the league. He's carved out a good career so far playing with poor quarterbacks, so now that he can be with a real quarterback, it's exciting to see what he will be able to accomplish. He isn't the fastest receiver by any means, but he can still get open with his route running and is a big target with great hands. Jefferson was taken in the second round in 2020 and started to get some good looks last year as a third target, taking advantage of the opportunity. He's a good route runner who also provides the most speed on the top end of this death chart. However, he is going to miss the beginning of the season, likely having knee surgery recently. Skowronek was taken in the 7th round last year and ended up seeing some good snaps as like the 4th, 5th wide receiver towards the end of last season, finishing with 150 yards, including the playoffs. If Jefferson isn't ready to go and Tutu Atwell can't step up in year 2, he definitely could get some good snaps early on, but he is entirely unproven. 
Atwell was taken in the second round last year as a small deep threat out of Louisiana. He ran a surprisingly slow 40 time and he hardly saw the field as a rookie. Not the most shocking of things though for the undersized and not apparently uber athletic receiver like he looked like at Louisville. With Jefferson out for the beginning of the season though, Tutu does have a chance to prove that that 40 time was just kind of like a fluke. He is still this really good athlete and be the primary speed threat on the team at least early on. Powell went undrafted in 2018 and has seen a bit of action as a receiver, but has provided most of his value as a returnsman throughout his career. Jackson went undrafted last year, but is yet to play. Harris was taken in the fourth round last year, but only saw a few snaps and no targets, but has a pretty great size and speed potential with being 6'5", uh, 210 pounds, and 4'4", speed. Koski went undrafted in 2020, but has yet to see offensive snaps. Akers went undrafted last year and saw only one snap. Tramel went undrafted last year, didn't play, and McCutcheon is a UDFA from this class. So for tight ends, they have Tyler Higby, Kendall Blayton, Bryson Hopkins, Jared Pinkney, Jamal Pettigrew, and Roger Carter Jr. Higby was taken in the fourth round in 2016 and developed into a solid tight end here. He's not the type of player to take over the game or make some crazy athletic plays and stuff, but he's in an extremely reliable pair of hands with only 12 drops since 2017, and he'll convert some key third downs while the defense is focused on all the other weapons on this team. Blanton went undrafted in 2019 and saw his first action last year. The team mostly operates out of 11 personnel, so the second tight end here won't be used much, which is good because Blanton and everyone else on this roster hasn't proved much at all here. Hopkins was taken in the fourth round in 2020, and he's caught all five of his targets last year, but he's mostly been a blocker so far. Pinkney went undrafted in 2020 and saw snaps in two games for the Lions last year, but didn't do much, and Pettigrew and Carter are both UDFAs from this class. So along the offensive line, their starters project to be Joe Noteboom, David Edwards, Brian Allen, Logan Bruss, and Rob Havenstein, with AJ Jackson, Max Pritcher, AJ R. Curry, and Adrian Ely backing up at tackle, Jermaine Ingram Jr., Jeremiah Cologne, Jack Snyder, Bobby Evans, and Chandler Brewer backing up at guard, and Coleman Shelton backing up at center. Noteboom was taken in the third round in 2018 and looked good in limited action, filling in for Andrew Whitworth. He got a sizable contract to stay here in LA to now be the starting left tackle, so let's see if he can live up to that. AJ, or Alaric Jackson, was a four-star recruit at Iowa who has started since his rookie year there. However, he didn't develop and ended up going undrafted last year, where he did see one game um, and looked pretty fine when he did get in. Percher went undrafted last year, but didn't play at all. And then players like David Edwards are the reason why Les Snead's aggressive strategy is able to work. Edwards was picked in the fifth round in 2019 and began starting week seven of his rookie season. He may never be like a star player, but they were able to find a cheap starting level guard and gave up almost no draft capital for him. And the way that they're able to just consistently do this at play at positions where they find less valuable, um, that's what's keeping this whole ship afloat while they're spending all their first round picks and all their um, salary cap on the more valuable positions. Ingram was taken in the seventh round in 2020, but he's only seen a couple of snaps so far. Cologne went undrafted in 2018, but he hasn't played yet, and Snyder is a UDFA from this class. Allen is a quality starting center, better as a run blocker than in pass protection. He was taken in the fourth round in 2018 and got extended by the Rams this offseason. When he has been able to play, he's been good, but he missed most of 2019 and all of 2020 with injuries. He did manage to stay healthy for most of last year, though, so hopefully he can keep that up. Shelton went undrafted in 2018 and provided a couple games of like Packer caliber play last year. Russ was taken in the third round this year out of Wisconsin where he played tackle, but he'll be kicking inside to guard here. He's a good athlete, so he should fit into this wide zone system and be the next like later round pick who's an immediate impact for this team. If Russ isn't able to take the starting job right away though, Evans could also win the job. Evans was picked in the third round in 2019 and has mostly played tackle so far, but he has seen a few snaps here under guard and that's where he's being listed now. Brewer went undrafted in 2019, but has only seen a small number of snaps so far. Havenstein is the biggest investment on this offensive line, a second round pick back in 2015. He's developed into a quality starting tackle, minus a poor 2019 where he struggled with injuries as well. 
Uh, he should be the most stable practice protector on this line and still is only 30, so he should have plenty of good years left. Arcuri was taken in the seventh round this year out of Michigan State, and Ely went undrafted last year but didn't play. So now for their interior defensive line, they have Aaron Donald, Greg Gaines, Ashawn Robinson, Ernest Brown IV, Michael Hoecht, Bobby Brown III, Marquise Copeland, Jonah Williams, and Elijah Garcia. So Aaron Donald has been one of the most dominating players of this generation, and maybe of all time. At 6'1", 280, he is an undersized defensive tackle, but he has pure muscle. He destroys any offensive lineman when one-on-one, -on -one, and even routinely beats doubles and triple teams. He makes this whole pass rush better too, because all that extra attention will go to stop him, freeing up opportunities for everyone else. That's why players like Dante Fowler and Leonard Floyd looked so much better here in Los Angeles than they have anywhere else. Gaines was taken in the fourth round in 2019 and is quickly becoming one of the better nose tackles in the league. He does his job in the run game, but he's also able to contribute as a rusher, piling up 38 pressures and six sacks last season. This could just be the Donald effect, Gaines just executing, but there's nothing to complain about there because he's doing a damn good job at it so far. Robinson was picked in the second round by the Lions in 2016. However, he could never establish himself there and left in free agency to join the Rams. He's been a good primary run defender of this team, um, playing anywhere from 3 to 5 tech as like a 320 pounder. Brown, the fourth, was picked in the fifth round last year, but didn't play as a rookie. He played edge in college and is listed at 270 pounds, but is listed as the defensive end behind Robinson here on these unofficial early depth charts. So I wonder if he's like bulking up, going to add some weight and play that like a similar position, but obviously lighter than 320 pound Robinson, or if he's going to just be like this pass rushing specialist five tech. Um, interesting to see how they're going to use him. Hoek went undrafted in 2020 and saw about 100 snaps last year in rotation, not really doing anything significant. Brown the third was taken in the fourth round last year as like a big 320 pound nose tackle, um, but he suspended for the first six games of the season for PEDs. Copeland went undrafted in 2019 and started seeing some snaps like halfway through last season, although he didn't really do too much when out there. Williams went undrafted in 2020, hardly making any impact so far, and Garcia is a UDFA from this class. So for edge defenders, they have Leonard Floyd, Justin Holland, Terrell Lewis, Chris Garrett, Daniel Hardy, Benton Whiteley, Kier Thomas, and Braden Thomas. Floyd has been a good pass rusher, but never able to live up to the ninth overall selection. After four mediocre seasons with the Bears, he signed with the Rams and did look much better, but that was likely the Donald effect again. However, instead of letting Floyd walk like they did with Fowler, they re-signed him and he produced again, even better than last year. He's definitely not a number one pressure and even shaky as the number two, but he's definitely effective in his role and had 58 pressures and eight sacks last year. Hollinge was picked by the Broncos in the fifth round in 2019, but was waived and picked up by the Rams after his rookie season. He's mostly used off the edge as a rusher, but can also draw back into coverage if needed. He had a decent start to last season before getting injured and missing the bulk of it though. Lewis was picked in the third round in 2020. He dealt with injuries at Alabama, which have also followed him professionally, and he hasn't been much of a difference maker so far when he has been able to see the field. Garrett was taken in the seventh round last year, but only saw a few snaps in one game. Hardy was taken in the seventh round this year out of Montana State, and Whiteley and the two Thomases are both are, are all UDFAs from this class. So for linebackers, they have Bobby Wagner, Ernest Jones, Traven Howard, Christian Roseboom, Anthony Hines III, Jake Gervas, and Jake Hummel. So Bobby Wagner is one of the greatest linebackers of all time. He's getting older, playing in his age 32 season, but he's still the best linebacker at diagnosing plays and can be a great mentor for the younger guys on the rosters too. The Rams traditionally have avoided investing in linebackers, so it was definitely shocking to see them go after Wagner and Wagner to be signing with his longtime rivals, but I definitely think this can benefit both of them a lot. Jones was taken in the third round last year and was up and down as a rookie, but started coming into his own by the end of the season and playing great in the Super Bowl. Now playing next to Wagner, it's definitely hard to see Jones do anything but get even better this year. Howard was taken in the seventh round in 2018 and has dealt with injuries. 
However, when he has made it onto the field, he's been a decent coverage linebacker, fitting the mold of a lot of successful uh, Rams linebackers as this undersized, athletic, former safety who was overlooked by most. Roseboon went undrafted in 2020, but he hasn't played yet. Hines went undrafted last year, but didn't play as a rookie. Um, Gervais, he went undrafted in 2019, but only saw defensive snaps when he was a rookie. And Hummel is a UDFA from this class. So for cornerbacks, they have Jalen Ramsey, David Long Jr., Troy Hill, Robert Rochelle, Dakobe Durant, Darion Kendrick, Russ Yeast, Grant Haley, Tyler Hall, Caesar Dancy Williams, Jerron Lowe, and TJ Carter. Ramsey is the best cornerback in the league. He's big enough to deal with physical receivers, but he's also a great athlete, able to stick on the more agile ones too. Last year, he played the star role on this defense, uh, following around the number one, but also kicking into the slot often to help with the run defense and mess up passing lanes down the middle. Long was taken in the third round in 2019 and looked good as a third corner here, but he did struggle with injuries a bit. He only allowed 50 yards or more in one game, and with the departure of Darius Williams, he definitely could be pushed into that number two spot. But this team did just trade back for Troy Hill, who went undrafted in 2015, but worked his way up to being a starter here in LA, playing both outside and in the slot. He was in and out of the roster last year with the Browns and didn't play as good there, so we'll see if he's just a better fit here in LA and can get back to that like quality level of play. Rochelle was taken in the fourth round last year and saw some snaps, including a few starts. He's a great athlete and has an ideal build at 6'2", 195. If he can keep getting good coaching here and develop his technique some more, he's got the mold to be a great corner. He just kind of needs to go out there and prove it. Durant was taken in the fourth round this year out of South Carolina and fits the mold of these late round corners that the Rams like. Undersized at 5'10", 180, but a great athlete to make up for it. It may be a year or two until he starts, but I'd be shocked if he didn't work his way up to being a starter before getting a nice deal from a new team. Kendrick was taken in the sixth round this year out of Georgia. Yeast was taken in the seventh round this year out of Kansas State. And Haley went undrafted in 2018, but hasn't seen significant snaps since 2019 with the Giants. Hall went undrafted in 2020, but has only seen a couple of starts so far. And Dancy Williams, Lowe, and Carter are all UDFAs from this class. So for safeties, they have Jordan Fuller, Nick Scott, Taylor Rapp, Terrell Burgess, Quinton Lakes, Jerrion McVeigh, and Dan Esom. Fuller was taken in the sixth round in 2020 and instantly outperformed his draft stock. He became a full-time starter last year and played good. Despite limited athleticism, he only gave up one completion to his zone that was greater than 30 yards, doing a good job of keeping things in front of him and letting the other stars do their jobs. Scott was taken in the seventh round in 2019 and was mostly a third safety last year. However, he was the starter in the playoffs where he was only credited for allowing eight yards. We'll have to see if the Rams found something in Scott or if that was just some of the playoff magic that teams need to win the Super Bowl. Rapp was picked in the second round in 2019 and became the full-time starter last year. This defense rotates coverages and doesn't have like the traditional free safety, strong safety dynamic, but you can definitely tell that Rapp is more comfortable when he is in those strong safety looks, closer to the line scrimmage as a quality run support safety, but his limitations in coverage. Ideally, he can be your number three and be that slot slash star role if Ramsey needs to follow the number one around, and Rapp can mostly be a run support and short coverage safety. Burgess was taken in the third round in 2020 and hasn't been able to consistently see the field yet, so far playing more in the slot than as a true safety. Lake was taken in the sixth round this year at UCLA, and McVeigh and Isom are UDFAs from this class. So for special teams, they have Matt Gay at kicker, Riley Dixon and Cameron Dicker at punter, and Matthew Orzek at long snapper. So Gay joined the Rams halfway through 2020, and since then has hit over 90% of his kicks. Dixon was taken by the Broncos in the seventh round in 2016, but spent the last four years with the Giants. Now him and UDFA Cameron Dicker will compete for the punter job, and Orzek became the Rams long snapper last year. 
All right, so now this is when I get into my whole season projection. I talk about the floor and the ceiling of this team, everything that can go wrong, everything that can go right. Uh, they're over or under whether or not I think betting it is a smart bet at all, and then the biggest strength and weakness on this roster. So pessimistically, I have their floor at 10 and 7, which is obviously a very high floor. Um, however, this team just this roster is just so loaded, and they they're coming off a of Super Bowl like they were the best team in the league last year. Um, but an injury to any one of these stars could really hurt them. Right now, Stafford's dealing with some uh, thrower's elbow, which I'm almost positive I had in high school. And if that's the same thing, then like, man, that's painful. And it's just really hard to let heal um, with the season so close to starting. He could regress due to that or maybe just some like random season on season stuff type regression, um, turning over the ball a lot more than you want to see. Acres, he might not be able to come back and be that lead back right away at least. Um, Cup might not be able to be, recreate his success from last year. And Robinson doesn't look like his old self. Tutu can't step it up early and Jefferson could be out for a while. Higby is fine again, but no other tight end is even worth mentioning here. Um, and then the drop off from Whitworth to Note Boom could be significant and Russell struggles as a rookie. Donald is going to be dominant no matter what, unless he like, is fully, fully injured, but he might be slightly less dominant where he can't elevate everyone as much as he normally does this year. So this pass rush just isn't as good. Like it's good to great instead of potentially elite. Wagner could start looking like real old out there and Jones might not be able to step it up in year two. Ramsey is great again, but Long and Hill could struggle as the other two corners and... The teases of good play from Scott from safety were just teases, you know. Optimistically, though, I could see this team finishing at 13 and 4. Um, this team definitely can repeat if things go their way. Stafford could be even better year two now in the system. Akers can become that lead back, elite back, just doing like everything three down, uh, run the ball, catch the ball, whatever you want. Cup and Robinson might be the best one-two punch at receiver, and Jefferson, Atwell, and Higby, everyone else too who's going to be catching passes, could just benefit from having such major threats on the team. All the new additions for the offensive line could just be plug-and-play. Like, you see these, um, this team use a bunch of late-round guys all the time, so let's see if they can do it again. Donald is elite as always, and the rest of this mediocre line is just elevated by his presence, and they're able to capitalize on the lack of attention, and this whole pass rush looks elite, despite not really having elite players outside of Donald. Wagner is able to turn back the clock a bit on a new team, and Jones takes some strides under his wing in year two. Ramsey is excellent again. Hill is able to look like he did with the Rams um, versus how he did with the Browns, and Long continues to look good when he does get out there. Fuller and Scott can make a pretty great safety duo despite um, being such late round draft picks because they've developed pretty nicely here so far. And then this over under is set at 10 and a half and that's pretty high despite playing in a tough division and also having to play the AFC West. However, I think it's deserving and I definitely think that unless their top guys get injured, they should be able to achieve that over. They have a tough first place schedule though, having to play the Cowboys, Packers, and Bills, which they could win or lose any of those, but I definitely think like one or two are the most likely outcomes. Um, the NFC South, I that should be another like two or three wins. And then with the AFC West, it is tough as once again, I could see them beating any of these teams. I could see them losing to any of those teams. I'd be like, yeah, like that, that could happen. I believe you. Um, so I think though like two to three wins is most likely just because um, like leaning on variance about halfway through his two and then I definitely think that they can sneak an extra one in over them and then in their own division I think it's tough but on paper they are the best team so they should be able to get at least three or maybe even four wins there um, so despite the over under being set at ten and a half I definitely think the Rams could definitely have the over there and then their biggest strength is Aaron Donald I mean, without him, this group of linemen and edge rushers would be bottom five or so. Like, it just, there's not really anyone besides him. But with him and how he demands two to three blockers on every play, he just elevates the rest of this group to be top 10, like, 
this whole like pass rushing unit is definitely at least top 10 because he's there alone like that's like yeah um he's the most dominating player in the league maybe ever and he'll be this team's biggest strength until he retires the biggest weakness on this roster i'm putting out their star reliance um so far through the Sean McVay era, they've been able to avoid injuries to these stars, but it could hurt them badly if any of them were to go down. Obviously, it would suck to lose your quarterback in Stafford. There wasn't a lot of wide receiver depth, uh, proven depth at least, beyond Cup and Robinson. And as I said before, without Donald, this pass rush is just atrocious. Ramsey being able to play anywhere on anyone makes the rest of the secondary's job much easier, and without him, they'd have to find a way to, one, cover the best corner or the best um, opposing receiver on the team, and two, take on more responsibility because Ramsey isn't there to be, like, a band-aid and do whatever this defense needs. Obviously, the strategy is working, and, like, I'm not judging at all. I just think the thing that would mess them up the most and derail the season is to throw like a wrench in that stars and scrubs approach by taking away the stars all right so that's going to do it for today's episode if you liked what i said leave a like leave a comment let me know um where you agree where you disagree in the comments below if you're listening to this on apple Podcasts, spotify wherever you might be uh, leave a five-star review help to push it out and yeah hit that subscribe button and i'll see you all next time